Why does anyone bother making or watching adaptations of great stories? If we already love something, why do we need to experience it in a different medium? Especially when adaptations so often disappoint the people who care about the source material the most. The Sandman 6th episode, The Sound of Her Wings, is why. Issue number 8 of the Sandman comics and the episode 6 of the Netflix show The Sound of Her Wings is the standout story of the Preludes and Nocturne story arc and it stands apart from the previous issues and episodes. In this issue of the comic, we have a shift from plot development to mood and character development, as well as the element of humanity and interpersonal relationships which was absent from Gaiman's previous comic issues. It focuses on mood and character in a way that had not been done before in The Sandman, as well as in a relationship between two characters that was rooted in emotions rather than physical conflict. This tonal shift is visually evident on the first page of the comic. In the opening scene, there's no gothic mansion, no hand in the shadows, no drama in Arkham Asylum as previous issues had begun. Instead, Dream is shown feeding pigeons. The color in the opening pages of this issue is also brighter and lighter than in the previous issues, and there's more space on the page. The visuals are indicative of Gaiman's conception of the purpose of the issue. Gaiman conceived of The Sound of Her Wings as an epilogue to the first story arc. The series had just concluded a three-issue intense mini-arc battle between Sandman and John Dee, and the lack of conflict in the opening pages of issue 8, as well as the inclusion of space and bright colors, prepares readers for a different kind of story. Unlike in previous issues, there are no villains, battles, or magical items. The focus is instead on Dream and his interaction with his elder sibling, Death. While episode 6 is a largely fateful adaptation of Gaiman's The Sound of Her Wings, the biggest change was shifting the setting of the story arc from New York City to London. Part of the reason was the COVID restrictions during production, but another was the storytelling itself. After spending 100 years imprisoned in a basement in London, it also feels redemptive for Dream since London treated him so poorly. However, similar to the actual comic issue, the environment in the episode is brighter and lighter and Dream is shown sitting on a park bench feeding pigeons. After defeating his enemies and regaining his tools of power, Dream is lost. Death's concern about him invites him along while she performs her own duties and reminds him that he too has responsibilities to perform. What stands out the most in issue 8 of the comics and the episode 6 of the show is not a tonal shift in narrative, but the introduction of the character of Death. She is not what readers and viewers had been expecting, and Gaiman delights in this fact. Since Dream's elder sibling was first mentioned in issue 1 of the comics and episode 1 of the show, you probably were wondering, when are we going to meet the Sandman's older sibling Death? And the choice of a female Death was deliberate on Gaiman's part. Death really became female because Gaiman wanted to mess with the innate sexism as a lot of the original comic fans tended to assume that Death was male. And Gaiman also chose to go against fans' expectations about Death's personality. Since we all know Dream is a brooding, all-in-black figure and is Death's younger brother, when thinking what is Death going to be like, you start conjuring up someone a hundred times more worse and dangerous, and instead of feeding into these expectations, Gaiman made Death to be a complete opposite of her brother. Although she's dressed in black, there's nothing of Dream's somber personality about her. She proves this by only a few sentences into her appearance, quoting from Mary Poppins, something distant Dream would never do. Death's large personality, full of smiles and cheer, presents a stark contrast to Dream, who rarely smiles and almost never laughs. Death is instantly likable. She's warm, welcoming, but also ultimately pragmatic. It's the mixture of approachability and relatability with intelligence and a no-nonsense approach to life and living that has attracted readers to Death. She's among the most beloved characters of the series. It's in this issue when Sandman really takes on the iconic tone we are used to, that ugly sort of realism that makes us feel like the world is more huge and complex and minutely detailed than we've ever really understood. It also really undercuts Dream's mystique. Previously, there's been this atmosphere where main characters, Burgess, Dream, Lucifer, D, Constantine, all have this really theatrical side. Everything is very grand and intense and important. Now we have calmer scenes with everyday people and Death speaks with authority and really defines the shape of the world for us and Dream. It turns out this is not a world of theatrical high emotions. Dream is just a bit of a diva sometimes. Take this panel for example. Dream is desperately trying to persuade his sister to entertain his important and intense train of thought and Death cuts right through it with her typical demeanor. And when contrasted to death, Dream really is such a little brother, and that revelation changes our entire view of everything that has come before. 
Suddenly, the audience realizes that even though Dream is an almighty anthropomorphic personification, he is in fact trapped by his own narrative and self-imposed limitations. Remember just after John Dee crushed Dream's jewel? He's just ended his quest, if you like. And consider what he says here. I always thought when I became king, I thought there would be applause. I thought somebody would say something. So D is feeling similarly unfulfilled by his victory. He just doesn't get the chance to moan about it in a park. Dream's imprisonment gave him something to work himself up about. He could imagine all the horrible things he was going to do by way of vengeance to those who imprisoned him, and then he could revel in all the feeling of power and self-righteousness that comes with such a revenge fantasy. And that also poses another question. Is death really that much more terrible than Dream, if at all? And have a look at the graffiti in this comic issue. The first one is right behind Morpheus in this panel. No one here gets out alive. It sounds a bit ominous at first, but when you think about it, it's sort of comforting. There's safety in knowing how life ends. You will die. And when we take a look at the next graffiti, dreams make no promises. Death is the end of your life on this earth, probably. But dream doesn't make any promises. You can be saved by dreams or you can be tormented by dreams. Dreams bring wisdom and pain and confusion, but they are not promises. We can easily interpret dream being more terrible than death, especially considering that dream can make a person's life a living nightmare, as he did with Alex Burgess. Whereas death merely takes people's lives and it can also be a gift. So these different graffitis portray the contrast between these two realms in the comic. For further evidence, look at the layout of this panel. We have this pillar type thing serving as a division between the two sides, death and dream. Dream is sitting on the stone steps, artificial, uniform, and a bit dull. Death, by contrast, is basically lying on a bed of roses. And the contrast in personalities between Dream and Death allows Dream to come to his epiphany at the end of issue 8. My sister has a function to perform even as I do. So Dream realizes after he spends the day with her, the Endless have their responsibilities, I have responsibilities. The conflict within Dream was not solved by going out and defeating a villain, it was not made better by recovering his tools. This is what created Dream's problems in the first place. Dream's responsibilities extend further than simply fighting crime in a city or executing a personal agenda. As his sister reminds him and the audience, Dream is the embodiment of a function, of an idea. The point at which Gaiman Salmon truly becomes Dream of the Endless is the point at which he begins to interact and connect with his sister. And perhaps this is why everyone embraces issue 8 and episode 6 there's a palpable change in tone and character and an overt introduction to this mythological frame. The sound of her wings, after all, is the first time that the Endless and their functions are discussed at length. That is the first introduction to the Endless as a family, and the fact that she has her own distinct personality suggests that the other siblings are also fully developed characters. They're not stock characters or types, but have full-fledged personalities. Although they function as anthropomorphic personifications of life processes, none of the Endless are one-dimensional characters. The Endless are capable of dying, although they're always succeeded by another aspect of themselves, and they're capable of making mistakes as well. They even can stop being themselves and walk away from their duties. The Endless interact on an emotional level, and these emotions bring about conflicts and concords between them. Desire, for example, often instigates the narrative conflicts presented to Dream in the series. Despite their engaging, individualized, three-dimensional characterizations, Gaiman does not allow readers to forget the symbolical and allegorical implications of the Endless. For example, when Death explains that what happens after a person dies depends on who you are and you never get to learn what happens to anyone else, she articulates Gaiman's own speculations on what it means to die. And by viewing each of the Endless within their own respective realms, and that is exactly what we get to do with Death in this issue and episode, the audience is invited to ruminate on what these ideas represent in relation to themselves and their own lives. Much of the episode's dialogue came straight from the comic, but it also definitely expanded on Death's feelings about humanity and how she views her unpleasant job. Even though people fear Death and aren't always ready for her gift, she gives it to them anyways, without pride, ego, or contempt. People feel as pleased to have been born as if they did it themselves, she says, yet Death doesn't hold that arrogance against anyone. We get the very best she has to offer because she knows that's what we need. And what she has to offer is understanding, sympathy, kindness, even when we probably don't deserve it. If dying is hard, being the manifestation of death is even harder. We only die once, but she will experience every single death from the beginning of time until the end. 
and that responsibility inevitably wore on her as it would on any caring individual. But then she had a realization that added new emotional depth to death. I used to think I had to do this all by myself, she told Morpheus, and she came to understand that at the end, she's there with us. I'm holding their hand and they're holding mine. I'm not alone when I'm doing my job. So that might be the single most memorable sentiment from the Salmon's first season. We are there for death just as much as she's there for us. Forget not being alone when we die. Meeting her is so much more than that. When we embark on this unknown journey, we'll have someone we care about with us as we take the first step. She knows most of us will be glad for the company of a friend when we need one the most. Even her lack of answers about what awaits us in the next life is beautiful in its own way because it's honest. Death is not there to tell us where we go or what's next, nor is she there to tell us everything will be alright. Death offers no more guarantees than life. Dying doesn't seem as terrifying when you imagine this that will be by your side. The act of dying on in this episode, whether in old age doing what you love or alone in an alleyway far too young, certainly wasn't horrible. It wasn't defined by sadness or anger nor even by the finality of life. Instead, it was about the comfort of holding a hand and the soft sound of her wings. The title of the comic issue and the Netflix episode refers to the sound that swings make. And these wings are probably more metaphorical than literal, although if you have a look at this panel in the comic, you can see what looks like a huge wing done in charcoal or graphite, and we can see something similar in the Netflix episode as well. Seeing and hearing all of that in the episode was powerful in a way that reading about it wasn't. Not better or worse, just different, because while no TV show or movie can ever fully capture every aspect of what makes a book or a comic great, live action adaptations bring elements the written word or a static illustration inherently can't. Things like the sound of a violinist's final performance as he leaves this world, or the tangible warmth and presence death brings to a room, or the honesty in her face as she conveys genuine encouragement and patient compassion all in a single tilt of her head. When we read, we're interpreting a single writer's work in our own way. We might all see some of the same traits in that from the comics, but ultimately she's unique to each of us because we bring our own perspectives and experiences to the character. Those subtle differences shape how we think and feel about comic book death, and that fundamentally changes who she is to each person. But now we all have a singular version of death to share. The existence of Netflix's The Sandman will never change the existence of Neil Gaiman's comic book, nor will Netflix's death change how you think about the version you first met on the page. All that's changed is that we now have two versions of death to appreciate each in a different medium that offer elements the other one can't. The two aren't competing with each other, they complement one another, and that's the best you can hope for from any adaptation of a great story. And that's the reason adaptations are worth attempting, even if they so often disappoint us. When done right, they can give us something new to love, while reminding us why we love the original in the first place. And you can't do that better than Sound of Her Wings. The Netflix series did more than introduce new fans to the beauty of Neil Gaiman's death. The Sandman gave all fans new ways to appreciate a beloved character with an episode and performance that exemplifies the best of what adaptations can and should be. The Sandman TV series is a success in so many ways, but none more so than how it manages to recreate what made Neil Gaiman's comic series so important to so many. Simply put, it makes you feel less alone in this confusing, terrifying, and far too often lonely world. Alright, The Waking World, if you enjoyed this analysis, please like the video to support it and subscribe to be notified of similar upcoming videos on Sandman and some other interesting stories as well. This was Says and Tales, till next time.